Speed flying originated in France a few years ago when a few paraglider pilots started taking old skydiving parachutes and using them to ski launch and land in the mountains. A couple of manufacturers recognized the possibility of the sport becoming mainstream and started manufacturing gliders specifically for speed flying. I'd say there's maybe 50 at the most uh, active speed flyers in the U.S. right now. And then you go over to Europe and you've got you know, over 1,500. Europe is the capital of speed flying basically for one reason, it, it, it's accessible. You can get on pretty much any lift, gondola, or tram with your speed flying rig and basically fly wherever you want, as long as you're not flying over the piste, which is a very small percentage of European ski areas. But to Europe, it was just so much bigger, you know, going off a 9,000 foot descent and then taking a tram up, sipping coffee the whole way. The culmination of one run in Europe was more than we would gotten the entire season in Utah. It's much more accessible and uh, it makes it the mecca for our sport. When you're speed flying, especially in big terrain, you know, big couloirs and rock faces and a lot of cool features. It's almost like sensory overload. You know, there's so much coming at you so fast and so much to avoid, but at the same time you want to be close to everything. When you're close and you're in the terrain, you can actually feel the speed. You can actually get the sensation of stuff rushing by you where if you're up high, you know, a couple hundred feet over the ground, you can look down and see the ground passing by, but you don't really get that feeling of being in it. Uh, for me, it's all about terrain flying. I, I love skiing, that's my passion. So when I speed fly, it's all about the wall hits. It's all about going off that cliff that no one's ever gone off before, at least certainly I haven't gone off before because it's too big. It's just simple, it's, it's effortless. You need to go in there with the attitude that it is very dangerous, but if you do things right, you make slow movements, it's a mellow, safe sport I can see myself doing well into my elderly years when I can't maybe do some of these other physical sports, I'm gonna be the guy speed flying. When you're going that fast and that low to terrain, um, you kind of start to get tunnel vision. You have to stay one step ahead of the glider and you have to look you know, anywhere from 50 to 300 feet in front of you, what terrain's coming up, or where you want to touch down with your skis, and where you want to drag a wingtip. When you're doing these kind of things and you're, you're that fast and that close to the ground all the time, uh, something's bound to go wrong at some point. I just misjudged. I was a little low on the rock and then I got a little bit of turbulence from Matt and uh, just got deep in the brakes and kind of put my skis out and let my skis take the impact and kind of bounced off the rock. Oh. Oh. Oh.
Speed flying is actually very similar to paragliding in the sense that the canopy is more or less the same. In theory, you know, we've got lines, we've got a glider. The wings we use in paragliding are quite a bit bigger and they're meant to go up and soar and fly around for long periods of time, where speed flying is mainly to go down. Actually, the great thing about speed flying is that it's, everything's just sped up. Everything happens faster. When you turn, you lose a lot more altitude. You have way more wind on your face, actually about twice as much. You know, you're generally flying about twice as fast. So in paragliding, you have a lot of time to kind of check things out. You have time to appreciate what's going on. With speed flying, it's just fast and furious. It's a lot more intense. We can be doing anywhere from 40 to 70 miles an hour. And, uh, you really have to be dialed and know what you're doing because everything happens very fast. For me, one of the biggest thrills and, and areas of excitement was not really knowing where we were going to land. But kind of describe, yeah, you're going to go around this corner and fly for 10 or 15 minutes, and then you're going to land in this valley, and there's uh, a tram and stuff, just kind of land near there, but you know, be careful because there's some things to watch out for. And you're kind of nervous up there, and you're know, like, wow, okay, well, I'll just follow you. Matt, go first! I don't know landing area! Where's the snow? <laughs> The flight we did off the Guido Medi was by far one of the most spectacular things I've ever done. It's about 9,000 feet above the Chamonix Valley. And, uh, you're, you're sitting on top of a glacier with all the hardcore ice climbers and mountaineer ski types. And uh, there we are with our speed flying wings and really no other backcountry gear. And we're going to be down on the valley floor in five minutes. Flying off the Gui was an amazing experience, just uh, having such a long flight, stepping down and different terrain you're going over and through and around, it was just awesome. Matt and I got invited to the Canary Islands, which is a territory of Spain off the west coast of Africa, to do some base jumps out of a paraglider for a festival. We're practicing foot launching our speed flying wings, both in the US and in France, and we decided uh, before the trip that we'd bring them just in case there was something that we'd be able to fly off of.
Sure enough, when we pulled into Frontera, there was a massive rim surrounding the entire city. You couldn't believe it. It looked like Kauai or something in Hawaii. It was just absolutely fantastic. Of course, the first thing we thought of is, can we launch the top of that? I mean, how do we get to the top of it? Is it possible? Is there a launch? You know, we immediately started dreaming about the possibilities of foot launching our speed flying wings from the top of that thing. When we were scoping the ridge for a place to fly, we came across this couar, and it was uh, about 15 or 20 degrees steeper than the rest of the hillside, and uh, that was that was our goal for sure. But it wasn't so easy. You know, there was clouds every day obscuring takeoff in the upper half of the mountain. There wasn't an official launch up there at all, or even a really good place to launch. And the landings at the bottom were mostly cactus and big, sharp volcanic rocks. So after being there for a few days and seeing clouds obscuring the top of the mountain pretty much every day, we started to get desperate. We were leaving soon, we wanted to fly it so badly, and um, basically we, Mike said, hey, let's just go up there and see. You know, we, just, we, just, we have to go up there and see what it's like. I'm just going to walk by. I'll call you guys when we get out somewhere. Call me if you see a break in the clouds. So the launch itself was clear, but just 10 or 15 feet past the cliff, it was totally thick clouds. And when you're flying in a cloud, and you can't see 20 or 30 feet in front of you, you can't see 20 or 30 feet beneath you or behind you or in any direction, it's totally disorienting. It's vertigo, pure vertigo. We really have no reference of exactly where we're at. You definitely don't know what direction you're going in, and you can have a really slight turn in your glider, and that turn, if it continues while you're in the cloud, you come back flying directly at the cliff face. So we were super apprehensive about launching into the cloud. Um, we each had compasses, but the compasses on El Hierro were just crazy. Um, it's, they weren't spinning in circles or anything, but they would definitely stick. We worked our way along the ridge to the spot that we thought was correct to the best of our knowledge. The terrain at the top was very flat, the cliff face and so the glider when you're running on flat terrain it can't really come totally overhead it's sort of hanging behind you so it doesn't really feel like it's flying because it's not it's a cliff launch basically you're just running and getting the wing up just over your head and then kind of jumping off the cliff um, you're not necessarily really flying yet until your body weight gets underneath it it's not popular at all to foot launch speed flying wings in fact there's just a few people that are doing it in Europe and all of the manufacturers categorically forbid it. I didn't think it was going to happen. We, we were sitting there just kind of sulking that, you know, you couldn't see 20 feet. And then the sun poked through. We couldn't see more than 20 feet, but we saw the outline of the sun, and the sun was low enough in the horizon because it was just before sunset that I knew if we flew towards the sun, we would end up away from the cliff. You guys going? Yep. Yeah. All right, they're going to go here in uh, five seconds. To the sun. As soon as we popped out, I looked down and saw that we were right over where we wanted to be. It was just a total miracle. Yeah! There it is! The huge cool R was just to our left. We made a few turns, dropped into the top of it, and had an amazing flight.
just so great to accomplish something like that when you think you're defeated and you just you figure it out and you make it happen. It just doesn't get any better than that. Seeing the possibilities arriving and then making it happen, even though it was somewhat complicated to get it done, it was just amazing. I mean, speed flying off of that was one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> oh, oh man, insane, insane. That was awesome. So cool, such a cool spot. The future of speed flying is, is pretty much undetermined at this point. It's evolving and it's cool to be in a sport that's new because you're, you're immediately kind of a pioneer. It's already changed so much from its early days and we'll see where it goes from here. <laughs>